Welcome to season seven of the Retail Tea Break podcast. My name is Melissa Moore, the Retail Advisor and Rethink Retail Top Retail Expert for 2024. Each week, I'll be joined by industry experts, retailers and brands to dispel the myths, share knowledge and give you an insight into the retail industry. Listen back to previous episodes on your favourite podcast platform or of course on YouTube. And while you're there, please do subscribe to the podcast so that you get to listen first every single week. So in the meantime, grab that cup of tea, sit back and listen in to season seven of the Retail Tea Break podcast. Today, I'm joined by a guest who really cares about what matters to the consumer, driven by a passion to bring quality, meaningful products to the market that people really want to use and to tell the story of those products in the most compelling way. Today's guest has had an incredible career bringing her creativity, experience and energy to roles such as programme maker at the BBC to communications director for the Women's Coalition during the Northern Ireland peace process. But most recently, she's back at the helm of a brand that's seen meteoric growth since its inception through its disruption of the self-tan category. And she has very exciting plans for the future. Alison Hogg, MBE, Chief Executive Officer and Founder of Vita Liberata. Welcome to the Retail Tea Break podcast. Well, thank you very much. And it is lovely to be here. Thank you for having me. I feel so honoured that you agreed to this uh, conversation because your experience is unbelievable. And I've no doubt by the end of this conversation, lots of people listening will have had lots of nuggets and ideas from your such incredible career. So look... No pressure. No pressure at all, the Alison. introduction, Melissa. Oh, my God. <laughs> but to kick us off, look, in the time that it takes to boil a kettle, as I always say on this podcast, tell us a little bit more about you and, of course, the business. Oh, my goodness. About me. Well, I always say to people, I'm very old at this point, but that's OK. That's a warning. OK, I'm not looking for sympathy. It's just I've seen it all before. I am completely unsurprisable and unshockable literally everything I think yeah I think mostly everything I can't think of anything I haven't seen and I've had a very long career therefore as you say I never think of myself as having had a career it's so interesting because I never worked for anybody like full-time I was always either a freelancer or a consultant or then I owned my own business so it's really funny that I really find it weird when people say her career I'm like did I have a career do I have a career is this a career so yeah I I started off I suppose I started off in Dublin kind of freelancing and doing work and working in the fashion industry and learning just about like how women tick I suppose then from there I went back into broadcasting and I I did a bit of front of camera quite a lot of back of camera for thoroughly enjoyed the behind the scenes, loved working in radio. This was by far the best thing you could pitch up in those days in your pajamas. Now you cannot because of cameras, but in those days it didn't matter. Like it really didn't matter. And I loved that. And because I loved the content, you know, more than the form. For me, it was always and has always been about the content. Actually, when I say that, yeah, I can see why I made such rubbish packaging to begin with for Vita. (laughs) It was all about... But it matters what's inside. And <laughs> in those days, which is in the early 2000s, it really, 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 uh, w- what was inside was about 50% of the value of anything. It was the outside that was so important. But anyway, that, I digress. Then from there, I went on to, to work in academia and then in politics a little bit, which I thoroughly enjoyed, but was very, I found it to be very intense. I'm certainly by no means a career person for politics. I I probably take it all a bit too seriously. So for me, it was just, it was enough. It was a great thing to be there on the day. It was a great thing to watch all those eminent people sign those docs. And then I was like, okay, I've done my duty for for Northern Ireland. (laughs) I'm out of here. So, and then I was kind of just trying to do a PhD and trying to do too many things all at once. And I suppose if I had to give the first nugget of experiences, like choose a lane. So in my case, I was trying to look after five kids in a blended family. That's a lot. Then I was trying to, you know, do my PhD full time. That's a lot. And then I was trying to earn kind of side hustle money 
working on Sky Shopping because I had worked in the Beeb before and I knew the rules around broadcasting. And so I was trying to do that at the same time. And everything was failing. Everything was going horribly. I was at the at the moment that I had kind of my road to Damascus revelation. I was trying to read Carol Gilligan, who's a very complex feminist philosopher, while trying to help my daughter, my youngest, with her homework. She was about six or seven at the time, while trying to cook the dinner for the blended family of five, none of whom was going to like what I was burning. And I realized, hmm, I've got too much. Something's got to give here. And then I had a ping. Oh, maybe I could. This shows you what a PhD student knows, which is absolutely nothing about anything in real life. Maybe I could go into business. Perhaps that would be easier than all of this. And it's not. I'm here to tell you it's not. <laughs> go, go, don't do your PhD, Alison. Go stick with your PhD. Stay in the library. It is far more fun. But anyway, I started it and then I like I had to finish it. I couldn't. Well, put it this way. It's not that I had to finish it. I just wasn't going to close myself. So for the next kind of 15 years, I really beat my head against a brick wall, trying to, you know, get the head through, trying to compete, trying to learn about the beauty business and trying to succeed and exit. And then eventually we did. And that was great. Good grief. And I'm sitting here almost gobsmacked. And, and crying at the same time, almost crying with laughter, howling with laughter really quietly while while I'm listening to you there. What a phenomenal amount. A, you fit in, but B, my goodness, you know how to juggle. Well, it's, it's, you know what I mean? I, I, I'm i female. Yeah. Yes. And, and that's what are, I was going to come to. Yeah. yeah we all do it. Not yeah, at that absolutely. level, Alison. <laughs> absolutely. Women are brought up that way. A lot of people have said to me, you know, in the past gosh, you started, you know, you started your business at a really late stage. I was 40, 39, maybe I was 39. Um, no, 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 definitely 40. And so it was like, people were going like, that's, that's, is that not difficult? And I was like, well, probably, because everything's difficult, that's worth doing. But also it's a huge advantage because I'm, I'm already having this huge background of experience bringing up to this business so it's not like I was 25 and pitching up and not having a clue about life people negotiation or anything else you know I had a lot of those soft what people call soft skills I think they're actually really important skills and I had already you know worked with a lot of people in the past I kind of had an idea of how to employ people though I had no idea what I needed at the time because you know I knew nothing about and beauty. So I thought that going into a business that I knew nothing about would be easier than doing a PhD. And I was incorrect. However, I did continue with the business. I didn't finish the PhD, but I did finish the business. Well, Camille, tell us on that note, tell us a bit more about this business, especially in the early days, because I'm going to call a spade a spade here and people are going to get quite angry, I'm sure, listening. It all kind of looks so glamorous nowadays. Everyone's on their TikTok and their Instagram, flying around the world, you know, making it all look so gorgeous. You and I know it's not like that at no, no, no. all. And it certainly wasn't, what, 15, 20 years ago. So no. what was that like? Well, it's look, it's it's don't forget that TikTok, Instagram and everything else is only a form of media. It's only a form of communication. So it's just the same as, you know, back in the day, if you could get a slot in telly, you would make yourself look as glamorous and wonderful as possible on telly back in the day when people used to watch television. And so, you know, it's just that that is, that is all that has happened. It has become much more democratized. So it's easier now in a way to break in because you have, a plethora of channels, you have a plethora of opportunities. And if you can hit the market just right, if you can hit the tone just right, you can cut through in a way that was impossible 20 years ago, impossible, because there was none of this media around. So there was nothing, there was no way, unless you had a huge budget, which of which I had zero to either advertise or PR, then you kind of just had to hack your way through. So it was legwork. And for me, the most important thing I think that I 
really did back in those very early days, this would have been 04, 05, something like that, was I went and stood in Castle Court Shopping Centre. I don't know if you know where that I is. I do really well. Yeah. Belfast, yep. And so this was before there was the other one. What's it called? Um, Victoria fam- Square, Victoria almost Square. across the road now. Yeah. So Victoria Square is, would consider itself to be the fancier one, I guess. But at the time, all we had was castle court and so i went and stood in castle court with my products because it occurred to me that maybe i maybe they there was something i could learn if i just stood and talked directly to women which of course now you can do through social media Mm. by the thousands but then i mean it was one woman at a time and um and what came back was we want really good skincare we want really good value we don't like the packaging, which is ironic because nowadays the packaging would have been like so on trend, so pared back, so perfect. But then it was just like, what is this? I was a millennial long before there were millennials. <laughs> so, so yeah, so I learned so much about the concepts around communication, around what women want, understanding the need, catering to that need and and basically not trying to educate the customer understanding that education is incredibly expensive incredibly so try to make any product that you that you develop really instinctive to use so that there doesn't have to be this massive education process around it i say all that and what did i end up making my money on tan and what does tan need it needs education. It needs huge skill to put it on properly. It needs all of these things. So I'm saying all that, and actually it's probably a bit of, you know, yeah. You shouldn't start a product that you have to educate against unless you've got a deep pocket or you're really, really, really thran. I don't know if you know what that means. It's like a Scottish word for like stubborn. If you're very stubborn and very determined, then fair enough. So, Which I'm so... starting to realise you probably are, and you certainly <laughs> were back in the day, because yeah. all of these obstacles, and that's all I'm hearing, and I don't mean that in a negative way, but oh. so many obstacles coming your way, and yet you kept banging down the doors, you kept talking to the customers, you, obviously the retailers started to come knocking at that stage, yeah. and that's that's like a whole other education in itself. Of course, of course. And, you know, I... I used to say to people, it's kind of, it's not that I'm driven. It's more like I'm like water around rocks. Do you know nice. what I mean? if, yeah. if I see a rock, I don't think, oh, stop. I just think, okay, well, let's go to the right, the left, the above, the below. That's just, I think, the way I'm hardwired. So oftentimes problems aren't, problems are for me genuinely opportunities if you look at them in a different Mm -hmm. way you know so but yes so we we basically we made this tan which I made for my assistant which I wasn't going to make a tan because I was making lip glosses and things like that that people seem to like and back in the day tanning was really a genuinely dirty word it looked awful it smelled awful it did terrible things to the skin it faded badly there was nothing good about tanning and my assistant said could you make a tan and I was like love <laughs> no I'm not gonna make that and she said no but you can make that better and it was that it was that sort of very trusting simple concept of you could make it better that I thought you know what now there is a challenge let's go and see if we can address the barriers to use so that's what I mean about the education that we went <laughs> I'm doing I'm I get completely against myself here but in doing that in removing those barriers to use, you know, you made it smell nice, we made it fade well, we made it good for the skin, we made the color natural, all of those things that we're now very famous for. Having done that, we then kind of took it to our versions of Instagram shop or whatever, which was TV3 way back, yeah. in the day, way, way back in the day. And we sold out immediately. So our first shipment, which wasn't huge, but it wasn't nothing, was sold out in three weeks. And I realized, Oh my God. Okay. Let's just put all of the lip glosses back in the warehouse and focus on tan. We seem to have found the thing that people really want that we have done in a very original way and and they love it. So from there came then, you know, various other opportunities. I had been to see boots about lip glosses, actually. It was, I think, 2007 or so. 
And while I was there, I brought this town that I'd made and I said, I set it down in the desk and I said to the buyer, look, I know you don't do tanning or anything, but if you know the person who does tanning, you know, just, I know we're talking about lip glosses, but just on the other side, just in case, would you maybe ask them if they would be interested and forgot all about it, forgot all about that conversation. Six months later, they definitely didn't want my lip glosses and I was all, <laughs> and thank God they didn't want my lip glosses because there was no way I could have afforded to be in boots for that. So then somebody rang me while I was in, while I was in Tesco's actually, but shopping for a barbecue, I remember it so well. And they said, this is Boots in Nottingham. And I thought, Boots in Nottingham? Have I been to Nottingham? What did I leave? <laughs> I thought they were like going to tell me I'd left my umbrella or something or my diary or whatever. And they said, they said we, we, we wanted to know you left a tan here a few months ago. We want to know if you'd like to list. And I said, well, I just thought to myself, God, she's making this sound like it's a trick question. So I said, well, of course I would. And she said, oh, great, 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 great. And from there, we went on to have a conversation. I was correct. It was like a trick question that yeah. you want to list. Because actually, once you understand the metrics around really large retailers, going into a very large retailer with a new product, a never heard of brand doing kind of tiny numbers with no money in the bank <laughs> I mean when I think about it oh my lord is a recipe for disaster and and that's exactly what nearly happened so we we not for the customer the customer loved the product and everything was going great and we were selling loads and Boots was very pleased with us and we were getting lots of press and everything was fantastic meanwhile you know I lost my house. I, I I had to mortgage it to pay fees or something. I can't remember. And so I, I never owned my house again. I lived in it for another 10 years, but never owned it again until I sold. I, you know, almost had to shutter myself or expected to be shuttered by the bank another three or four times. But I always said to my husband, I'm not going to close the doors on myself because I think we can get through, because I think the product we have is unique and, and good enough that we can get through. So, so I suppose, you know, once you're in so deep, having gotten in so deep, then, you know, I would caution anybody, well, don't close yourself down. Like, don't mm -hmm. jump first, because you never know what's going to happen tomorrow, the next day, or the next day. And in each of those four cases, where we were within days, honestly, within days. And the stress was, you know, hugely pro problematic for me in terms of my physical health. But regardless of that, each time, because we clung on, because we didn't just fold and go, each time something happened, either an order came in or an opportunity came through or we got money from somewhere or we secured a loan for something, something happened that allowed us to ply forth. But I could have, I could have given up, you know, I could have just like said, okay, that's it, I'm done. And I wanted to on so many occasions, so many occasions I wanted to, and would have had an easier life, would have probably gone back to academia, probably gone back into broadcasting, would have been as poor as a church mouse, but sure, whatever, I would have been happy. And that's so interesting there because it's all consuming. And I'd say, even though, as you said, you came so close sometimes to to other people pulling the plug, whether it was the bank or whatever, because there was so much going on and you were wearing so many hats all the time yeah. that I'd say you couldn't see the wood for the trees. So actually you, you had no choice but to keep going and to push forward. It's what you knew. Yeah. You had brought an incredible amount of experience to the table at that stage anyway. But to fast forward through the chaos, fun chaos, and you've learned a lot, and I want to come back to that, because you sold up. You ended up kind of getting out. You sold up. And then, and then and only recently, you went, should you know what? I learned loads. That was fun. Let's do it again. So no, I did not do that. <laughs> okay, so just to clear up the record, no, I did not do that. I did not go, oh, geez, I can't think what to do now. No, I had a great, I, didn't, I was having a great time. Do you mean um, to say you weren't bored? You weren't sitting I there knitting? And... 
<laughs> no, no. Well, I mean, I did some knitting and I did some, like I did lots of things and I was having a great time, I have to tell you. I was helping out some other businesses as well, mm. various things. But then the phone call came to me and that's different. Okay, so the, the phone call came to me saying, essentially, we've got an opportunity. Would you like to buy Vita back? There were lots of other words, but I mean, at core, that's what, that's what it was. And I knew when I knew when the person who called me called me and I heard his voice on the phone, I was like, oh, geez, what is going on now? And, and, you know, asked him as such. And he was like, oh, that's what I have missed you. You're so funny. And I said, no, I know, I know, I know. It's hilarious. But seriously, what, <laughs> what do you want? And, and so, yeah, so they, they gave me the opportunity to, buy it back and I thought well I mean obviously I had a couple of caveats in my head of things that needed to be in place before I would consider that but once I very quickly find those things out then I was like yeah yeah I mean because also there were quite a few of the women that I that I'd worked with or who'd come to work with me in the early days and for, for a very long time we had very very long standing record of of employment at Vita you know people come in and just never leave and so it's fair enough they learn so much and then they become so valuable to the company so a lot of those those women were still very happy to come and work with me again and that gave me a really good feeling because I thought well okay we're kind of like a restart up now like we're very tiny because for reasons that I cannot comprehend so a lot of the distribution, you know, was pulled back by the previous owner. So whatever, I'm not here to judge. It's just like, it was confusing to me. So, so we're, you know, we're, we started from a much smaller base than I'd sold. However, the principles are all the same. And what I discovered, which was interesting, was that albeit there's AI and albeit there's TikTok and everything else, at the end of the day, if you are giving someone a product that is essentially a physical experience of their embodiment, there is nothing, no AI, no kind of jiggery pokery, digital jiggery pokery that can replace that. So, so that puts beauty indeed, and even fashion in a really, really strong place because because women really want these products they genuinely really want these products and they want to feel better in the moment that they are physically there in their own embodiment so they don't only want it just for what they look like online maybe they, sometimes they do but really it's just it gives them confidence and joy and if you can work in an industry that that helps impart confidence and joy do you know what that's a that's a great privilege not something I understood first time round, maybe, but it's something that I truly get now. Do you think then, and especially kind of second time around now, have you empowered that then within this team? So we know a lot of that team were obviously were original. They wanted to work with you again. They were fantastic. Yeah. Have you then maybe learned or wanted to, I suppose, delegate and empower them even more this time around? Because I suppose you're a lot sure Absolutely. of yourself in the market and everything going on. Do you know, it's it's an entirely different situation because by the time that I had a big team, I also had investors. So therefore, I had people whose money I was using to, you know, keep going or build a business. And that lends a whole level of stress and responsibility over the top of everything else. And that's very, very I mean, I, I find that quite difficult. And, and of all the stresses that I had, there was another stress that that whenever I decided to spend money, it was not always my money that I was spending. And as I say, there's a there's a massive amount of responsibility comes with that. And that's scary. This time, there's nobody else's cash in the pot at this point. I mean, I'm sure at some point, if we grow at the rate that certainly our business plan is is giving us, then I, you know, I might go looking, but right now don't need to. And that is fantastic because now I can really, when I take the risk on someone, it's my risk. I'm taking my risk on someone else. And so I am allowing people to make some mistakes. I expect nobody to make a mistake twice. Okay. But everybody's allowed to make a mistake, you know, of any particular kind 
once. Once we get to twice or three times, then I'm afraid I can't afford that. But those first mistakes are such big learnings for people. You know, there was one, actually we were talking about a kind of a product type that we were, we have been considering and, and the girls really wanted to push this through. I voice my concern at this particular product but anyway they were so determined oh no 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 this is this, we need this we need this we need this and then for various reasons we had a conversation only two days ago and i said well so how's that product doing said, oh well you know it's like you know well i think what we know is that we don't always need to and there you go if you've learned nothing more than this from that episode and we haven't actually lost money over it, maybe not made money, but like not lost it, then actually that was a lesson worth learning. That was the reason that that happened. Let's just all learn and move on. And those big lessons can only be learned with spiky edges. Do you know what I mean? You, nobody goes through life as a rolling smooth ball, always rolling on a grassy verge. You know, that's not how life is. And so so I am really, I, I'm actually quite thrilled watching the progression of the women, all of whom are now younger than me, of course, because I'm ancient, but what watching them learn, like really learn and pivot, learn, pivot, learn, pivot. This is This is tremendous. And I think that I'm growing a stock of really amazing people. I just hope they stick with the program and don't bugger off down the road. But, you know, if they do, good luck to them. But that that tremendous gratitude of having fantastic people and allowing them to, to be imaginative, to express themselves, to make mistakes, to learn and to move on and to grow and know that you're safer as a result, that is fantastic. It's so that's special. Yeah. It's yeah, but it's it's expensive. <laughs> and there, there is that. And I think I think they're very fortunate that to be under your wing in that respect and to be able to grow and make those mistakes and also to empower you're empowering them, I'm sure, yeah. in that respect, which is wonderful. Yeah. In that respect, because of course you you've been a mentor to so many other businesses. I suppose are there any other nuggets that you've lived by or worked by over the years that you would share that really you think kind of would suit lots of businesses especially in this crazy business that we find ourselves in in retail and with with brands anything else that you just you'd say actually always i live by this well i suppose there's a couple of things one is very simple and it was somebody who told me this really early on i can't even remember who it was who said it it was a chap i can't so i apologize if <laughs> he happens to be listening but somebody said to me sell what sells if in diffs, sell what sells. By that, I mean, if you get, if you have an array of products and some are moving and some are not, unless you have a very good reason to keep plugging at the ones that are not, and sometimes you do, really focus on the heroes because that's what will pull you through. Those are the items that people really want. They're changing lives, in our case, confidence and joy, but it's still, it's still life-changing follow those stars yeah now not to your detriment and not down a rabbit hole but definitely that was a really helpful thing and the sell what sells was was you know the the park the lip glosses focus on the town because this thing has gone gangbusters people must want this thing this is our moment take that opportunity keep your eyes wide open and be incredibly flexible i think if you're going to, the most successful person in business will be the one who is the most flexible, always. So, and by that, I mean, you might need to flex the business or you might need to flex yourself. So always question yourself at the end of the day, did I do that in the best possible way? Could I do it better tomorrow? If, if I had that to do again, would I say the things I said? Would I do the things I do? Would I have made the decisions that I've made? So question yourself, be very open with yourself. I don't mean be stern, be, be gentle with yourself, but also be truthful. If to nobody else, at least to yourself, you know, I think this, this is terribly important. And I think also, you know, if you've got a great product, fight for your fairness in the market. 
So make sure that your price point is correct. And don't let the retailer, sorry, retailers, if you listen to this, but it is true. Don't let them squeeze you so hard that you have nothing left to give because you need stuff and money in the background to push people to their stores. And oftentimes either the retailer doesn't appreciate this nuance or the manufacturer brand doesn't understand the metrics around everything that the retailer is going to ask you for. And so only go into retailers that you can afford to be in. Brilliant yeah. advice. Honestly, honestly, it's okay. You d- not you don't you don't have to be in the big boys. You don't have to be. And if you're going to be in the big boys, have a deep pocket. Phenomenal. Can I just say phenomenal? I have no doubt that people will be rewinding. They'll be definitely taking notes. I just agog and I'm really appreciative of your honesty because I think that's what's so special. You tell it how it is. You have this lived experience. But you're so wonderful and to be able to share that in an open and honest way. So I thank you on behalf of an awful lot of people listening for listing a lot of those key tips because it's it's the reality of what's going on. It's the reality of what's needed right now. And very few people talk about it. But and I hate to do this because we could definitely talk for the next few hours and we might have (laughs) to do this again. I'm thinking final question, though, as we kind of rock in towards 2025, what's coming up? What's next? Oh, well. We do have some exciting, I genuinely some exciting products coming through. We have a couple of lovely nuggets coming through that I wanted to make as I sold the business. They never got made. And so now we have reinvented them with six years more kind of tech behind it. So I'm very excited about about some of these new things that we're bringing out, new ones. And then we're also bringing back some really beloved products that for some reason fell off the peg with the last guys. So so Tristel, for instance, a lot of people would know Tristel, beautiful bronzer, is coming back. And we've got we've got our mooses coming back in in an even better form. So there's things we're we're just we're just really saying what does the market need? What's not there? What can we satisfy? What can we bring that is going to be meaningful to our customer and then doing that? Because of course blur is still the number one of its of body makeups so we still have that as our anchor and to date no one has managed to many people have copied it but nobody has managed to equal it so thankfully so that gives us our like you know our future security it's like a bread and butter but it's much no it's like our cake and caviar you know it's like it's a wonderful product but then that allows us to really look at what what else has kind of just missing or or we need or what do our customers want whenever i came back in a lot of customers came through on instagram and we're going oh will you bring back this we bring back that will we and it was just lovely to to hear people having genuinely loved the product so so much that they remembered from you know over a period of a long time the products that that had been their favorites and they were asking for them back and i and i felt that well then let's do it let's let's bring these fantastic products back but but let's them bring them back as 2025 so you know let's soup them up let's put in some amazing new ingredients that have really only come into being over the last number of years because chemistry has kind of like taken a lift due mainly to to ai i must say and to the understanding of how the skin works <laughs> So that bit is good. AI is good for that. It's just not good for being with you whenever you want to be embodied and beautiful. And I, and I, you know, one thing I do want to say, and this is a thing for any women listening, it doesn't matter what you look like. It matters how you feel. Really. I say that from a place of working in the beauty industry. It's joyful to feel great. And and we use products to do that, but don't get hung up on that. Don't get stuck on that. Get stuck on how you feel about the world. Focus on that and everything will feel better anyway. Do you know, it's very, very important. It's very, very important because the beauty industry, like all industries can be a bit, it's got two sides. It's got the joy side and then it can be a bit toxic. And I'm, I'm not into the, 
toxic side. I, I like the joy for sure. What, what a gorgeous note to end on. It really, really is. But look, wow, after hearing all of that, if you've enjoyed today's podcast episode, you definitely have to share it. I'm not even going to ask. I'm going to insist you share today's podcast episode with those around you, especially in the industry. But actually, there's just so many nuggets out there for anyone in business or growing themselves within a business. Remember, you can listen back to the past Retail Tea Break episodes on your favorite podcast platform or, of course, on YouTube. And then do connect with myself and Alison over on LinkedIn. I'll obviously pop uh, Vita Liberata's website details in the show notes and on all the social media that this goes out on. So if you haven't already done so, pop along, have a look at the website, go buy the product, especially all the newness coming in 2025. It's incredibly exciting. Alison, it's been an absolute pleasure and an absolute joy. And I have no doubt you'll be back again soon. But thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much. It's been a complete pleasure.